Hello and welcome to 2016 NTI. I'm Mary Watts with allnurses.com and I'm so pleased to have here today Kathy Gazetta. Ms. Gazetta is a nursing mentor, consultant, and an award-winning researcher focused on the importance of holistic care. She has served on the clinical faculty at George Washington University School of Nursing in Washington since 2007. Mm -hmm. You were honored today as the preeminent nurse expert on family presence and as the consummate mentor of pediatric patient care research by nurses at the bedside. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about what you mentioned before about what did the room do when you presented that? Well, Mary, it's so interesting because I've been working on family presence um, during resuscitation in adults and in pediatrics since 1994. Um, when a nurse came to me and she said she just brought the mother and father in um, to the room of a patient who was undergoing resuscitation. He was 14, he had fallen out of a tree, had severe uh, trauma, um, and the patient was dying. And the parents said they had to get in. And the father had had bad words with the the child um, just a couple of hours before, and they needed to get in to say things, and um, she brought the mother and father in the room, and uh, and the child died. Um, following that, the next day she came to see me, but her there was talk that she was going to lose her job, because who did she think she was to bring a family in during in a trauma bay during mm -hmm. resuscitation and then she asked me the question she said Dr. Gazetta why do we ban all families from the bedside during resuscitation and of course that was my knee-jerk response well because that's what we do you know that's what we do we I was trained that you get family out of there because it's too traumatic for them and they, you know, they couldn't stand to see all that was going on and you get them out of the room gently and quietly and you go on with your resuscitation. And, um, and then I got to thinking, you know, my background is holistic nursing, cardiovascular nursing, critical care nursing, and I was thinking what could be more holistic than the integrity of the family unit mm -hmm. and to be together in crisis. And I, and I said to Teresa, I said, I have no idea why we ban families um, from the bedside during resuscitation. And that started our journey in 1994 to where we are today. And it has fueled a number, a number of dozens of different research studies and publications and that kind of thing. And it sounds to me that, you know, you saw kind of a conflict there. And you asked why. You know, why do we always do this? We've always done it, but is it what we should continue to do, or is there a better way? You also mentioned holistic nursing. How would you define holistic nursing? Well, I think there's a number of ways to define it, Mary. I think it's, you know, it's an individualized kind of thing, but I, I think basically it's enhancement of healing of the whole person mm -hmm. from birth to death. And, you know, birth is tends to be a very joyous thing, death not so much, um, but from birth to death. And the whole family presence um, idea fits, is just an operationalization of what patient-centered, patient family centered care is and what you know the bio psychosocial spiritual body mind spirit um, kind of care is and we operationalized that um, in a number of ways and you know I was fortunate back in 1981 to I guess I was fortunate to write that book called critical care nursing body mind and spirit and um, what we what I knew because I am a critical care nurse is that critical care nurses are technical and they like th they like the details and they want to be the best of the best and have the best knowledge of pathophysiology and pathology and drugs and and machines and ventilators and electrocardiograms and I knew that in this book we needed to deliver the best of the best mm -hmm. of the traditional biomedical care but also then to integrate it with the best of the mind and spirit therapies. 
And, you know, how do you do that? And people would say to me, well, we don't have time. We're so busy. We've got all these patients, and they're so sick. And, you know, I would say to them, there's, it's, a, it's a different way of being. And exactly. let me give you a for example. A patient is having severe pain, and morphine is ordered, and the nurse goes to get the morphine and draws it up and comes back in and is ready to inject. And yes, you can say, I'm giving you something for pain right now, or you can say, this is morphine, and I'm going to inject it right now. And it's a very, very powerful medication. And I want you to work with me. Now, I'm injecting. I'm working. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just talking. I'm just talking. And for the next minute or two, you ask them to visualize this powerful medication going to the source of their pain. You ask them to close their eyes if they can for a minute, and let's take a deep breath, and let's let your belly rise and fall, and let's work with that pain medication. And that didn't take any longer than me injecting it. It's just that I introduced a little relaxation, a lim little imagery, and a little power of suggestion. That's holistic nursing. Exactly. You learn to yeah. incorporate it into your actions already, what you have to do to provide the care. And you um, kind of alluded that, you know, we're really good as nurses to address the physical aspect. Yes. That's the easy part, really. Yes. And we focus on that, but we tend to forget, you know, next easiest is the psychological, the mind. And the spiritual seems to be one of the harder things. But, you know, in your writings, you've written about that. You've, um, you know, examined all different aspects of that. Tell me a little bit about how you have found that addressing body, mind, and spirit affects patient outcome. Well, because, you know, the, the parent of a child who's in pain, mm -hmm. yes, they want their child not to develop pneumonia. Yes, they want their child to get better. But they also want their child to be able to sleep tonight and to be able to eat a meal or get some nutrition and fluid. They are concerned um, about a child in pain. And so in terms of all the outcomes that biomedicine looks at, in terms of the, all the pathophysiology and all the curing that they want to accomplish with drugs and surgery and, and that kind of thing, um, that's really not what that child mm -hmm. and the parent are the most concerned about. They're really concerned about looking at this whole child and the whole parent-child relationship and to me, the only way you can address that is, is to, to look at the biopsychosocial, spiritual. And when families understand that you're not just giving somebody a medication, but you're giving them the medication in conjunction with what the patient wants. Now I'm flipping back from adults to, to kids, but um, again, one of the things that we do with adults is we partner with them and in the decision-making process and in the outcomes. And what do they envision their outcomes to be? And we respect what they envision those outcomes to be, and then we plan towards those outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so it's a partnership, I think, unlike what it used to be decades ago when the medicine guys were the, you know, the um, power keepers and made all the decisions, and we as patients would say, yes, doctor, but. Whatever you want. <laughs> but that's not, you know, that's not the kind of patient we have anymore, and it's certainly not the kind of parents that I see of children right now. And um, they are demanding that they're part of this process mm -hmm. for, for the most part, and should be demanding, and should be part of the, of the partnership team in making those kinds of decisions. Exactly. We have to consider the whole unit, the family unit, that when a patient is in the hospital, we have to look at them, you know, the family affects them and their outcomes, and we can't ignore them. And that kind of gets us to the next point, um, that you're one of the foremost leaders on family presence during resuscitation. And that is such a difficult thing for anybody to witness. It's difficult for nurses to to be part of that, but for a family, they don't know what's going on and they're worried, they're concerned. So what would you say 
um, as, as a website that um, is there for thousands, hundreds of thousands of members, all nurses, we would like to know what would be one thing that you would like to share with our membership to make this very traumatic experience? Thank you for asking that question. It's an excellent one. The most important point about family presence during resuscitation is that it's an option and that not all families want to be there. Um, in the research that we've done in the dozen or so studies, um, we have found that in pediatrics, about 97 to 99 percent of the parents want to be there. They want to be there. They see that as their role. They're the child's advocate. They want to be there as a parent. Um, it falls down a little bit lower with adults, probably in the 87% that want to be there. But the point is that not all people want to be there. Mm -hmm. So that's the first option um, because it's not an expectation that they be there. And um, nor would I invite somebody into the room if I saw they came in with an altered mental state from drugs or alcohol or if they were curled up in the corner in a fetal position or if they just had put their fists through the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, those would be all kinds of um, candidates that would not be candidates for coming in the room. But if they're assessed in a very quick time to be a candidate and a, a suitable candidate, um, then they get asked the question, would you like to come in? Would you want to come in to this resuscitation? And, and I can tell you that the ones who don't want to come in will say no <laughs> immediately. Mm -hmm. And for example, I had a grandma who said, you know, I just was in here with the trauma. My grandson just got shot last month and I can't go through this again. So it, the answer was no on that one. Uh, another one was, you know, I don't do blood, but my husband will want to come in. Um, and so then we keep them informed, we keep them updated, um, and, and we respect their decision making because I think inherently we each know whether or not we can do that. Um, but on the other hand, I've also had families tell me that was the hardest thing that they've ever done mm. to be in the room during that resuscitation. And yet, in the same sentence, they will say, but I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else. And so that gives you, um, you know, if I had anything to say to all nurses, it would be the need to be there by the majority of families and parents is so incredible um, that it probably is going to be illegal someday to, you know, ban mm -hmm. families and parents from the bedside because the benefits will be so concrete and, and so established as standard of care that um, there could be lawsuits if you don't bring people in. Exactly. So um, I, I would say if you, you know, if you think about your child or your husband or your mom and, you know, would you want to be there? And I've had many a trauma doc say to me, no, I wouldn't want to be there. Well, yes, they would. Of course they would, you know, I, I think. Um, but, but we know, at least from the research, that the majority of people do want to be there. And so that need to be there is just so strong and so incredible. Um, and, you know, taking comfort in knowing that it's the hardest thing they've ever done, but they would not have wanted to be anywhere else. And one of the questions we always ask in our research is, if, God forbid, you had to do this again, would you? It's kind of like having a root canal. Once you've <laughs> had one, if you asked me, would you like to have another one, I'd say, no, I, no, no, I'm not, right. not doing that again. We always ask that question for that very reason, because I think it's a reflection on, okay, now you've been through it, would you do it again at, under similar circumstances? And they all say yes. Exactly. We have to remember that as health care providers or carers, it's not about us. It's not about our comfort level. That's right. It's always about the patient. <coughs> and now we're extending that out to the patient's family, the unit. And you did provide um, care to the whole unit, the, the unit, the family unit, by giving them the choice, the choice to say yes and the choice to say no. And that's so important because that in and of itself shows respect and they um, will have a more positive experience exactly. come out of this traumatic experience. It's bad enough to have to go through it, but to have the experience that the nurses, the healthcare team, 
respected us. They gave us the choice, and we are the ones that said yes or no. And I guess I should say as an educator, you know, people don't need to make any of this up. Um, the Emergency Nurses Association have put together all the guidelines and all the standards nationally for family presence during resuscitation and invasive procedures, and those guidelines have been well formulated. They're based on the evidence, and they're available through ENA. But also, AACN, um, the meeting that we're at right now, um, has had a practice alert guideline for family presence during resuscitation. Um, I just got done revising it, um, and it was published in Critical Care Nurse in February of mm -hmm. this year. And it's got the latest research, the latest evidence, the latest documentation, the guidelines for how to do this, how to set it up. It's not something anybody needs to reinvent. And it's something that people have used in, in study after study after study to be sure. Because the, the number one thing that people worry about is that families are going to lose control and interfere with patient care. And, you know, let's face it, patient care is the priority. That's why we're there. We're there to take care of that patient, and the family, you know, quite honestly, is in the background. Um, the family gets in the way and stops the resuscitation for any reason. That is not what's best for the patient. Right. And so that's part of what we do is to see if possible if there can be a family presence facilitator there. That is someone who's assigned to that family to guide them through the experience before they get in the room, while they're in the room, and to de debrief and meet their needs after they've been in the room. Um, but all of those guidelines are all set up, and it's not complicated. It's, you know, it takes a little education, and certainly I would encourage um, your, your nurses, all nurses, to do some reading on it. Um, I don't see a lot of family presence during resuscitation, you know, outside in the parking lot of a hospital or in the cafeteria. I mean, it does happen. Certainly, we know it happens. Um, I don't see a lot of it going on on the medical surgical floors or, you know, in, the, in OB or psych. Um, and so those, um, those kind of locations tend to not be as involved as if you were in a critical care unit where it happens frequently or an emergency department. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Gazetta, for talking to us thank about you. this. This is such an important aspect of nursing. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy being here. Thank, thank you. you.